that is a following. Mm -hmm. So building a following that will invest in you as much as in your work. Mm -hmm. And those are the two things. And those are the two things that have to constantly be growing together. So basically, um, there is never just the writing side for mm -hmm. any writer in this in, in this industry anymore, just because mm -hmm. it's so oversaturated. You have to be writing, but you also have to be building up a following mm -hmm. either. And, you know, different writers do different things for that. Some some writers have blogs. Some writers have um, published with um, different kinds of publications like literary magazines or with um, articles in, in reputable, excuse me, reputable journals. Mm -hmm. And you just have to find what your niche is, and mm -hmm. you have to stick to it, and you have to persevere. That's the biggest thing is perseverance. Like, um, I know a lot of writers um, in the DFW area, and I know a lot of writers that push and push and push, and they put books out, but they don't do the representative side mm -hmm. where they're building an audience, and they're building a community of people to invest in them as much as in the work that they're writing. Mm -hmm. And what happens to them? They get a book out, they sell 100 copies, and that's it. That's the end of it. So you have to look at both. I mean, it, even if you look at bestseller lists right mm -hmm. now, if you look at bestseller lists, the people at the top maybe are selling 500 books in that week mm -hmm. on some of those lists because there's so much saturation. But if you create a following behind you, if you create an, a group of, say, 5,000 people, that are very passionate about what you have to say as a person, mm -hmm. then they're going to buy your book, hands down. They're mm -hmm. going to invest in you and in your writing at the mm -hmm. same time. Now, um, traditional writing, which is going to a big publisher and getting traditionally published that way, um, mm -hmm. it's actually the same exact thing, except for they're doing a lot of the management side. Okay. But you're still having to go to the appearances. You're still having to appear on the radio. You're still having to do all of those things building an audience for your book. Mm -hmm. So regardless, writing is no longer just a write the book thing. It's a, I wanna get my voice out there and I want people to invest in me as, as much as in my work that I'm doing. Okay. Um, so what to what you said, uh, Supa, about um, wanting to kind of write for yourself, well, you're the right candidate for this because if you're writing for yourself and you're sharing your vision of the world, your ideologies, your hobbies, what's important to you and why it's important and why you're passionate about it, mm -hmm. then people are going to latch onto that passion and that's how you create a following. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard for, for someone to just write and put the book out there anymore. There has to be an element of sharing that with other people that isn't in your book, that's just live. Like Twitch is a great example. Mm -hmm. Like if you create a following on Twitch of people that just love what you have to say and what you're doing and um, your kind of vision mm -hmm. um, of the world or just what you want to share with the world, like that's that's the most important thing to me. I that's a really great explanation. And it's it's something I thought about when I was younger, but it just the more we live, the more I've lived at least, the more I've just been like, you know what? Um, I'm just I, I I get so preoccupied with other things because you have to deal with like other human emotions and try to figure yourself out that I've I've lost steam on like mm. trying to build that following you know mm -hmm. and um, it's just I, I'm I'm now 25 so I'm back here at the beginning I'm restarting my life all over again in America uh -huh. and um, I think well I think now if there was ever any any if there was ever any better time to start trying to build a following it's now and yeah. um i i think one of the reasons is because when our minds are so focused on this next big idea it's really hard to make any progress on a goal that's my experience at least because i've lived abroad in um in different countries and i've had this idea that i want to write a book that i want to do this but it's never been it's never been um stable and I think stability as a writer, what do you do to gain like stability in your writing? Like, do you have like a set time every day where you write? Do you have a goals and deadlines to meet? Then what, what do you do to make sure that you stay on the path to making progress moving forward? You know, it's funny. If you'd asked me this like two weeks ago or three weeks ago, I would have been like, what? I'm not really writing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Because And the thing is, um, the reason I started streaming the writing process on Twitch and the reason I did the one week challenge, which mm -hmm. is writing a screenplay in a week, 
um, was because I hadn't written anything. And I know I can write, right? I know I can do it. I just hadn't been writing. Mm -hmm. So my first, the first thing I had to do was sit down and set a goal, just an, a goal I could push myself to achieve that wasn't too easy, um, that would challenge me. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what happened. I, I set the goal and my accountability is the people that are watching, but also the people that I tell I'm a writer and here's my goal. Mm -hmm. So I would say as a writer, the most important things you can do is set those goals that push you to uh, accomplish more or to accomplish those goals, mm -hmm. but also set up the accountability of telling your family and your friends. I, I apologize. My dog is also snoring in the background. I don't know if you can hear her, <laughs> but uh, I can. Yeah, no. yeah. All right. Good, good, good. But uh, I, I like, kicked her a second ago, but she just kept <laughs> snoring. Um, um, I think we all should demand a dog tax right now. A, a dog tax? What does this mean? Dog tax. Ta you have me? to show us your dog. Sure, sure, sure. I'll show you my dog. I'm gonna, she's okay. she's actually gonna wake up though, and uh, oh, no, don't wake her up. Then she, that's fine. Later. I mean, it's just, she'll wake later. up and then she'll immediately go back to sleep. That's how she does her things. Oh, okay. Um, up to you. <laughs> but um, yeah. Let me just get my camera on on on, okay. the, on the on the show really quick. Take off these headphones. All right. But um, yeah. Now she's awake. So this is my dog. Her name is Muffin. She's a long-haired chihuahua. She's <laughs> she's very fat. And um, yeah. Oh, do you wait, all... I don't think we can see her on your stream. Hold on, wait, hold on. I think it's that's uh, a little time lagged. Give me just a, give it just a second. Oh, there we go. Okay, I got it now. <laughs> yeah, this is this is her. She's uh she's she's enthusiastic about writing too. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> but uh, she's gonna she's gonna go back to sleep now. Go. Oh, okay. She's very cute. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. The dog I, tax has been paid, y'all. <laughs> the dog tax has been paid. I love it. Yeah, I don't have a dog. I want a dog, but I, I there's a level of responsibility I haven't met yet. So soon, soon, soon. the dogs will come. I mean, you're on your path with, with writing already, making these goals. Make a goal. Make a goal to have a dog, right? Is that what we're saying? Uh, yeah, I guess you're right. I guess that needs to happen. Make a By the way, the, um, yeah. the quote I talked about earlier, the three Ps, that was from Robert Wise. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, um, just FYI. <laughs> I've got it linked. I, I'm, I'm saving links so that we can share them later. Cool. Please and thank you. Um, my question is now, because I, I was thinking about this yesterday. Um, I did a, a food and drink stream yesterday where basically... Oh, really? Basically, I went to Fuddruckers, which is like a, uh, a burger joint over here in Miami for uh -huh. fast food, and the burger was absolutely phenomenal. But uh -huh. um, I thought about it, and usually in the past, I've lived my life year by year because I always do. I always have contracts that I work on. Um, like if I'm going to get a job working abroad in another country, it's a year by year contract, so, right? That's how I focus on okay. living. But yesterday, I thought about it, and I was like, a year is a really long time, and it's really hard to make sure you stay on point on hitting those goals to make sure you're making progress. So I thought about maybe six months, have like a six month goal list and make sure that you're hitting like a goal every month. Um, in terms of writing, um, what what kind of goals do you hit in the short term versus the long term? Uh, another good question. So for me, all my long term goal is, uh, is, <laughs> is always to, um, to get a manager. As a, in screenwriting yeah um now as manager or agent it's either way mm -hmm. um but to, to be represented professionally mm -hmm. is my goal because once i get that that is a way into and and basically into working with the big studios mm -hmm. so that means the bigger projects can get made and in general as a screenwriter you're kind of a contractor for every single job you get hired for mm -hmm. in screenwriting so I know that for me to get hired for those, um, I have to have somebody representing me um, mm -hmm. at that point, because that's just the way that you get into the industry. The only other way I can think of doing it would be going out and networking myself, but I'm in the great state of Texas, so I don't I don't have as many people I can go to and say, hey, here's me, here's my work, and here's why you, sh you should work with me. Okay, okay. Um, so like, those that's my long-term goal, and every project I have, I sit down and I look at um, the, the things that are the most important for that project. So I, I teach this workshop called The Producer's Mindset. And every project I write, um, of course, has its creative 
uh, its creative side, which is, is here's the story, here's the theme, and here's the story I want to tell and why I want to tell it, right? Mm -hmm. But the other side of it has to, there has to be a business side because it, you know, writing and screenwriting especially. It's all about me attracting producers and filmmakers and people that will want to fund the project, not getting an audience right away. Mm -hmm. So in screenwriting, I have to think of the the end goal, mm -hmm. which is get a producer who will fund the project and then get it made. Um, so producers mindset wise, I'm always thinking about audience. I'm always thinking about um, I, I'm always thinking about <laughs> who would actually come watch this film. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and going from there. So in the short term, those are my goals is make projects that people want to see first off. And the reason I can say I, that people want to see it is by looking at it from a producer, producer's perspective. Now, mm -hmm. if you're writing a book, it's the same thing. You're just looking at it from an agent's perspective or from mm -hmm. somebody who wants to read your book, a reader's perspective. So it's very similar um, mm -hmm. in concept, mm -hmm. but the, the reality is, uh, the long-term goal has to be has to mirror the short-term goal in that I have to look for who's going to look for this in the long term and apply that to my writing now. Mm -hmm. So no matter what happens, I'm always going to be writing screenplays, um, mm -hmm. at, at least this point going forward. And those screenplays are always going to be my curriculum vitae to attract the the, the talent, the, the agent and the manager. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's really cool to have that reflection of the long term and short term. Um, for me, like, it's it's weird because this is the first book that I haven't wanted to publish. I haven't wanted to publish it online. I want to like finish it. I want to finish the first draft before I even like get started with it. And I want to finish the first draft uh, this year. But um, yeah, but I don't know. I feel like my understanding of the industry is still juvenile. So um, it's it's interesting enough to say yeah, I have these ideas, I have this passion, I, I persevered, but then there's the whole different world that you haven't even immersified yourself in. And and Dan, when did you first get involved in the industry? Uh, well, I I want to circle back to that question, Suba, but I've got a question for you. What's up? Um, so with your book, um, where where do you want your book to be? Once it's once it's all made, once it's done, once it's bound, once it's shipped out, where do you want it to be? In whose hands should it be? I want it to be in college students' hands who are looking to do study abroad or looking to go abroad to Japan. Oh, perfect. So basically, you have a message in your book, not yeah. only um, a message, but you also have uh, that goal in mind, which is wonderful. Um, in the nonfiction and in the nonfiction world, mm -hmm. there's a thing if you're going the traditional route and you're trying to attract the publisher who mm -hmm. will kind of fund you in making this book, mm -hmm. um, you would actually build what's called a proposal. And a book proposal is sounds very uh, technical um, because it is. Mm -hmm. It's essentially a thing that you send forward to a publisher to say, here's my project, here's the audience who's going to want to read it, and this is why you should publish my book. Mm -hmm. um, that's the traditional route. Now, the other route is if you're going to just write this book and put it out into the world, mm -hmm. then that's the other route, right? It, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing bad about it. It's just a completely different route. There, there are two books that I'm looking to write about Japan. Um, one of them is this creative nonfiction journey, and I'll explain to you more of what the book is after I get tell you about the other one. The other one is okay. um, a philosophy book about a philosophy of writing and how I used writing to create 10 stories that dramatically changed my life in Japan that led to self-discovery. Because um, ah. the, the term Super Genki Life is, a, um, is the philosophy that, I, that I'm trying to brandish in the world. Super means super in Japanese. Genki means energetic or charismatic in Japanese. And life turns it into the lifestyle. And I'm trying to create a philosophy of writing to allow people to become the captains of their own ship because each book installment of my philosophy is going to be called the captain's log because screw the words journal and diary. They assign <laughs> no importance to your writing. 
I hate them. My mom the other day said, oh, are you writing in your diary? And I'm like, mom, don't say that to me. I completely blew up on her. And, and she's like, oh, I'm, I'm oh, And she looked God. at my father. She's like, oh, and she, she winked at my father. Oh, I'm sorry. It's your captain's log. And I'm like, dude, get out of here, please. You don't understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, take me serious, mom. Vision yeah. said it right, mom. <laughs> <laughs> but um oh. again i've been restarting my life so frequently that um it's 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 weird i i've gained the story material but i'm just starting to get into like wanting to be a professional in the writing sphere and that's mm -hmm. the biggest fear for me because um my grammar is not grammar has never been my strong suit in any language and um i'm a good speaker in every language i speak in I speak Japanese, Spanish, and English, um, but grammar has held me back and people have read my work and they say they like my ideas, but it's like always grammar. And Should I get an editor is one of the big questions that's on my mind nowadays. Should I do this? And um, these are the two books I'm trying to write right now. And I wanted to self-publish the philosophy book, but I wanted to take uh -huh. the, um, the creative nonfiction to a publisher. I see. I see. Okay. Because I know okay. it does take a long time for your book to get published with a publisher, if I'm not mistaken. It takes about a year after you sign up. Um, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what I, would, what I would tell you is that um, everyone misses stuff in their writing. Every mm -hmm. single person that writes. And no matter how many times you go through and edit it, you're going to miss something, mm -hmm. which is the editor's mantra, essentially. <laughs> Um, editors, I, there's an organization called the Freelance um, Editors Association, or the Editorial Freelance Association. It's one of the, I think it's EFA actually is what it stands for. Um, and I, I talked, I've talked to those people a lot because I was considering being an editor. It's not for me, I found out. Um, but everybody uh. should get an editor eventually. And if it's just grammar, then you would just get somebody who can edit your book for grammar, not like a developmental editor. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, that doing that is not too expensive and mm -hmm. it's an investment into the long longevity of your book mm -hmm. because of course your final draft needs to be pretty flawless you're still going to miss stuff no matter what happens mm -hmm. um, but you want to do the best you can in publishing it so you need an editor hands down like having somebody else edit it that's a friend is just not good enough unless they're a professional editor mm -hmm. um, like and hiring an editor for a for a nonfiction work shouldn't be very expensive mm -hmm now it's it's yeah yeah go ahead what i want to talk to you about is because um the i i have a lot of i have more passion right now to write the creative nonfiction book than i do the non the solid nonfiction book because um mm -hmm. i say creative nonfiction because the the premise of my dreamers in japan book is um i've lived in japan for two years and i had uh -huh. two very different experiences because one was seen through the lens of a college student and then the other was seen through the lens of a young professional uh, working in Japan, right? Yeah. And I had experience beforehand, and uh, I had two different things that drove me to go to Japan each time. So what I did was I said, how can I take those two years of experience and, and put them into one? How can I make a one-year kind of story? And what I did was I took one year and I made him a boy, and I took the other year and I made her a girl. And oh, um, okay. both people are going to go to Japan under different premises and experience the same, the same trouble. And then by serendipity, they're going to find each other on two separate occasions in Kobe because it's two different, um, two different holidays. And then when they find each other, they're going to rediscover the reason they came to japan in the first place and then oh. then they're gonna fall in love and uh -huh. it's gonna show the forward thinking of a young person on the path to self-discovery and um wow okay i like it i like the idea and basically a lot every story is a story that i created in my own life just edited to look like it was someone else's life and right. um, that's what I was saying, like the, the six degrees of communication. Uh, I don't want to give a big chapter reveal, but I, I might as well. I, I, I want you to understand how I, I mean, I'm sure you, you understand how this is working, right? 
Uh, you mean six degrees of separation? Yeah. Um, and yes. I'll, I'll tell you, I'm going to write this. This is the next chapter I'm going to write for um, for Monica. It'll probably be uh -huh. done in the next couple of weeks. Um, when I went to Epcot, I went to everybody at Epcot and I said, how do you say it's a beautiful day to be alive in your language? I literally went to every single slot at every single place at Epcot, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, China, everywhere. Uh -huh. I, I learned how to say this. And um, I didn't realize that when I went to Canada, someone had taken a photo of me, right? Uh -huh. And then when I got to Japan and I got to Kobe, um, I went into the office room and I met my senpais and one of the senpais recognized me. And I was like, <laughs> and I was like how do you know me? And he That's says, awkward. my friend <laughs> at Epcot sent me a picture of you and told me that you were working in Japan. And it just so happened that the guy I met at Epcot had a friend working in the same city that I was working in, in Japan, already there. <laughs> and like, That's awesome. that was the crazy, <laughs> that was super crazy. Like I had no idea, like that was super unexpected. And that was the six degrees of separation literally happening uh, in my life. But I created the opportunity by being bubbly at Epcot, you know? <laughs> that's that's fantastic. Especially if you if it was like an instructor who who you're coming in under. Like that's really cool. It, it, that's exactly how it happened. And I, I jumped up and my, my character's gonna do this too. I jumped up and down in front of all my all of like the admins and stuff and made a really weird impression. And acted like a schoolgirl, and it was really awkward. But um, it, it's it's just these are personalized experiences. But I'm going to show you the lens through like a third person point of view. And yeah. structurally speaking, I don't know. Does real life work different? This is my question. Does real life experience work differently than book experience? Because like I'm building all these stories from my past, but like I don't know if it should be built differently, like to actually get published. Um, that's a good question. Um, hyperbole is not against the rules of nonfiction. So if you say this is based off of my life experience mm -hmm. and you're forward about it being creative nonfiction, you can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. As long as it's based off of your story, your nonfiction. Mm -hmm. So literally do whatever you want <laughs> in that space. Now, on the opposite side of that, um, if you have to bend the truth to make it a better story, bend the truth. No nonfiction book has ever been completely honest mm -hmm. because that would be boring. Normal yeah. life is oftentimes boring. So take those uh, take those creative liberties and bend bend to the story to make it a better story. That mm -hmm. that's definitely acceptable. Mm -hmm. Like nobody would write nonfiction and nobody would read nonfiction if it weren't the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unless you're like Whitney Houston or somebody's writing the biography for Whitney Houston. If it's not like that, and it's somebody's life like that, and it's your life and your story that you're telling, then mm -hmm. yeah, bend the rules. There's there's no, like you're not in the public eye, right? So nobody's watched you every minute of every day. So you can bend the rules however you want to in that story because it's creative, nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to think about it because again, like I I've I've lived all these years and I've I've wanted to write, but I've never like put myself down to actually write. And now I'm here and I'm in America and I'm like, okay, now is uh -huh. the time to actually start uh, writing finally. And I don't know, man, it's just, it's just, I get excited. If you ever come on my stream and you see me writing, you'll see how excited I get doing it. But like, uh -huh. there's always that fear aspect of like, like what, it's not even the fear of a failure. It's the fear of being successful and having mm. everything change because like, you know that there's a different dynamic when you actually uh -huh. when people are actually when you get when you get popular there's a really big dynamic that just comes in and changes your life almost and that's maybe one of the things that I haven't even noticed that I've been um that's one of the reasons why I procrastinate perhaps I don't know um yeah i the i think what what hits me most of the time mm -hmm. is is not <laughs> is looking at the work that i have to do um, in order to be successful. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what just gets in my way. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not a fear of success for me per se. It's a fear of putting in all the work and not being successful. So, you, you, so that's all right. Go ahead. No, no, I, I'm writing that down. Fear of putting in all the work and not being successful. 
Yeah, I think yeah. that's 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 that's, that's yeah. what gets in my way. I think but that's, you're you're yeah. you're kind of the way that you're uh, approaching this this kind of not not really anxiety, but this like fear of success um, is a little bit bit different. It sounds like it's because for, for me, um, I think that I'm happy right now. Like I'm happy. Like my life, I'm happy with it. Like I'm generally like like happy, and um, I think that yes, you can always do more, but you always risk losing the current feeling by doing more and gaining more knowledge and applying yourself more. And um, I don't know. It's just it's just like it's the fear of leaving this cu this cushy comfort zone of happiness that sometimes or well, most times makes me want to procrastinate and prevent myself from doing more, you know? Do you understand how that yeah. how I'm wording this? Oh yeah, yeah, completely. Um, see, I, if I feel that way, and if I, and you know, a lot of writers feel this way mm -hmm. um, and, and get a little bit of anxiety because of, you know, wh what does it mean to actually get your voice out there and have it heard mm -hmm. um, in such a wide format as in a novel? Because, you know, you're putting everything you are into a novel or into mm -hmm. a book or into creative nonfiction um, or into your philosophy book as well. Um, if that's the case, well, you just have to look towards the future and ask yourself, what is it that you can accomplish in your life? And how will that benefit others by sharing that voice? Mm -hmm. So it's it's this constant back and forth in my head, at least, um, kind of like an echo chamber. It's like. Be successful, you know, but, <laughs> but, um, you know, have to deal with it, have to live with it, you know. Um, but then also I get to look at what I want to share with the world and the vision of the world that I want to share. And um, that brings me right back into it. Oh, yeah. It makes the uh, tormented artist, um, I think, is is where that uh, cliche comes from. Yeah, it's that it's that perseverance phase of the passion perseverance and what's the third one? Remind persistence. Remind? Persistence. Yes, it's the perseverance phase, right? Um, yes. It's um I but persevering is actually not the hard, what what do you think is the hardest one here cuz like I feel like persevering is not as easy is I feel like persistence is the hardest one out of the 3 Ps. What do you think is the hardest of the 3 Ps? Yeah, um, <laughs> I one thing I, I learned from like the corporate world. Sorry, your your mic was breaking up there a bit. I apologize if I talked over you. No, um, no problem. So, um, I think everybody has a different personality, mm -hmm. and you have to come to terms with which of those P's is going to be the hardest for you. Yeah. Because I think everybody's going to have a different P they struggle mm -hmm. with. Um, but mm -hmm. that also means that you can fill your life with the people who have patience or the people that um, are better at persevering through hard times and they'll lift you up and make you stronger as a creative in filmmaking that's just a natural part of the process is identifying what you're good at and what you're not good at and mm -hmm. finding the people to fill the gaps and make you better uh, by surrounding yourself with like amazing people mm -hmm. um, especially in the creative world um, because like you're if you don't have a film crew you don't have a film you know in mm -hmm. filmmaking in, in writing, you don't have a book unless you have a publisher and somebody who believes in you, maybe an agent as well. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think like for me, I am very patient. I, I can, yeah. I've done a lot of stupid things um, because I'm patient that didn't really reward me for it. Yeah. But it's just because I'm patient. I'm, I'm willing to sit through it. Um, I'm also very passionate. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I get very loud when I teach workshops. Yeah. So like, I, I know that about myself. I hear that uh, already. Perseverance, perseverance is my, uh, is my part that always gets me in trouble. Okay. But what I do is I have uh, a network of friends that if I am experiencing that trouble, I can go to them, vent with them, share my trouble, and then they can lift me back up. Um, it, with that, um, for them, it might be patience or perseverance and I'm able to do the same thing. Uh, with them i'm able to lift them up mm -hmm. in those ways so so yeah it in the creative world like you have to surround yourself with creative people that's why i love yeah. like twitch writers network and this whole this whole writing category in in uh in twitch because man there are just so many people that want to love and support each other and i think all of us have different pieces that we live by mm -hmm. or that that we're kind of our uh, expertise where our expertise lies if you will 
And I think what's interesting, and this is something I talk about in um, the philosophy version of writing, is that we all have like different priorities in our lives. And I think all humans have the same like top 10 priorities, but our priorities shift based on how old we are and like what experience we have. Mm -hmm. And in terms of I'm looking at and looking at this through the lens of the three P's, I think that each thing will shift in terms of how hard it is. And what stops a lot of people is not being aware of what P is hard at that moment. And then uh -huh. what, um, what P is easier because there have been moments where I've been hard, hard strung for passion. And then there have been moments where I'm hard strung to be persistent, but it's like figuring out that the order of what is hardest and what you need to be focusing on. Um, I think it's wonderful that you said this creative network because I, I am now coming to the realization that if I want to even take this to the next level, I have to be a lot more invested in, in the creativity side. And that's how I found you actually, because another one of my streamer friends was talking to oh, me really? about raiding, um, getting involved in like Japanese communities and stuff. And then I was like, you know, I haven't raided a writing stream in forever, like literally forever, like months. I used to do this all the time. Uh -huh. I forgot about it. And then I, I searched up and I saw your stream and I rated you and that's how we had this connection. So I think it's, it's, it's wonderful because it's, it's like yeah. what you're saying right now is literally how we met. And it's like, that's really cool in my opinion. Yeah, completely agree. Uh, so I, I want to talk more about your project yeah. because I, I have questions for you and I, I want to, I, I want to go further into your, these concepts because okay. what you just pitched sounded like a really well put together pitch so i'm sure you've been talking about it a lot on stream right uh about these two book concepts i've been i've been re rehearsing a lot in real life i love i love telling Good. people these ideas and um i'm one of those people that if if you if you if you turn me on i won't turn off i'll just i'll just keep talking keep talking keep talking like for forever i'm yeah. practicing my snap i haven't been able to snap my whole life <laughs> but recently I've had some prowess in snapping. So now, now I'm addicted to snapping my fingers. It's Snap that the fingers. perseverance, man. You just got to keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, I, I, I have been writing recently. I have been writing these stories online and, um, and the way it is, is I am reliving these stories, but I'm adding um, different like dynamics. Um, like I think for Monica's story, um, what she's really going to figure out is she's going to, she's going to find her dead mother in Japan. She's going to realize how much she's like her mother living abroad because, um, her mother died of cancer when she was four years old. And, yeah. um, the way I pitch it is like just young enough to form memories and old enough to feel the loss. You know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. um, she's always been like a, a daddy's girl, but like she's accepted her father's role as law. And then she's just been following her father blindly. And then when she graduates college is the first time she says, you know what, I'm going to divert and I'm going to do something different. And that's where I just got to in the editing process for the, um, for this chapter. Nice. But, but, um, the way it is, is that I want people to see, like, I want people to feel like it's real. I don't want like people to think that it's not real and that it couldn't happen to them. You, you, have you ever had that kind of idea as a writer that you want people to like actually like empathize like and see themselves in these positions and see themselves doing these things? Oh yeah, every book, um, every project I've ever worked on, um, empathy and relation to the main character, the protagonist, mm -hmm. has always been at the forefront. Now in your case, you've got two protag protagonists, so you're dual protagonisting in this story. Um, so I, I feel like you're already there. Um, and it sounds like you already have the structure in place to create that if she's having this um, kind of also coming of age journey yeah. with her parents. Um, so it sounds like you've already got the workings in place for that, for that empathetic relationship. Mm -hmm. um, for me, every single book I write, it's part of the character process. Mm -hmm. That That's it. Like that's, that's one of the most important things you can do is is create an investable character because if you don't have an investable character you don't have a story anybody's going to care about mm -hmm. um yeah that's just that's just where i'm at with it um i i have more questions about your this these projects um but yeah. i want to ask a broader question what's up uh so you have this philosophy concept in a book but you also have the creative nonfiction. Uh, since you're 
already kind of in the middle of writing this creative nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, what would stop you from combining both into a single book? It's actually the thing about this is that, um, and this is weird. This is going to be interesting. I'm actually building a world view. I'm building a story world that's founded in the real world. Like, okay. I'm, I'm, I, I don't know. It's, it's hard to, it's weird to explain, but I've used writing to create every story that I've ever written about. Like I've, I've literally, one of my favorite pastimes is just to sit down in a coffee shop and just write and, re and, re and record my experiences in my captain's log, not a diary. Not a journal, mom. <laughs> you hear me, mom? Yeah, um, not one of those. But um, it, it's it's just it's what I've enjoyed the most, and it's what I've done literally everywhere I've ever been. I've just um, I've 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 created some awesome experience, and then I've just written it down like right after. Like when I was in Spain, I was and uh -huh. when I was in Spain, I was traveling in Segovia with some friends that were Japanese, right? And my Japanese friend is an idiot. Well, she's not an idiot. She's just, uh, she's, she's, she's trying to figure out things, right? So she took out her phone and she's like, look, look, world. And then she tripped and broke her ankle, right? Oh, oh in another country? That sucks. <laughs> yeah, we were all oh. there and we were hours away from where we lived. And what did I do? I went up and I picked her off the ground. And then the other Japanese guy was like, whoa, you're like a superhuman. And I, I, and I ended up carrying her around Segovia for four hours because I didn't want to leave. <laughs> so like, oh my God. so that was me using my, my writing because writing, it's the tone of voice that you develop through writing, right? Just creating yeah. these really memorable experiences that you can explain to people. I literally carried this girl up and down stairs all around the place and it was just so strange. But the way that I've developed writing as a tool has allowed me to live life the way I've wanted to. And that's that is the um that is the philosophy aspect of that's the philosophy aspect of that i'm trying to create but it's going to be present mm -hmm. in um in my in my character's writing says so monica um since she was since she was so controlled her father is like marlin from finding nemo and um okay and since she was so controlled all her life she had like this dreamer inside of her that wanted to like talk and like say things so she started a um uh, she took journalism back in high school and she started this blog called if only if only the world could hear me and um, her pen handle is is Artemis Artemis Invictus and mm -hmm. she was writing this blog for a long time and um, the way she uses it to come out the, the way that she uses writing mirrors the way that I used writing in Japan you know what I mean yeah and that's, no, I'm, there, I'm there with you. And that's the story world. It's like all these books are going to be strung together at some point where like you can read them in order and like really understand how everything was created. Interesting. And is that going to be the concept for the philosophy book or is that the way that the creative nonfiction is, is laid out? I think it's going to be the, it's going to be the concept for the philosophy, but everything is, um, everything is around this concept of the philosophy book because um mm. it all starts with and i'll tell you what how i figured out the to make this thing called super genki life um you know people always called me crazy when i was young because i was passionate right people always like you're so crazy but like i'm like yo crazy has two meanings right it has a negative connotation and a positive connotation and uh, uh when i didn't know any better i was like yeah 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 i'm crazy i'm cuckoo for cocoa puffs right that's what I said to people, right? But then when I went to mm -hmm. Japan for the first time, I was at Shibuya and there was this Hachiko, there was this statue of Hachiko, right? And I was with my friend, Josh, and um, I, I, just, I was there and I was just like taking a picture with Hachiko and there's this picture where my face is really serious and then there's this girl glaring at me in the background and like there's just me and the dog. And my friend was like, you know, Andres, you're, you're not... You're, you're you're just super genki and i heard this word for the first time and i liked uh -huh. it right and when i liked it i started saying i was super genki and then when i got back from japan i started believing i was super genki and then that's when i made it into a lifestyle and that's how i created this this concept of um super genki life you know yeah and um that's pretty cool 
This philosophy Actually, is all about self-discovery. <laughs> you have a much better backstory for your name. I just have to tell you that. <laughs> no, it's wonderful. It's it's it's. I mean, I've I've. This is this is my identity, and I and I could I have like Dan. If you if I told you the whole backstory, I could. I, Look, there's a bigger backstory to every backstory that I'm even saying right now. Like to go back to the genesis of where I got this idea, I'd have to go back to when I was like 11 years old. Uh, and, and then to go back to 11 years old, I have to go back to 10 years old. And then to go back to 10 years old, I have to go back and back and back. I think it's like everything started in a way that is just so weird. But um, I think this is how life should be lived. I think that life should just be this crazy journey of like, trying to figure out the self more than anything because if you can figure out the self you can really be happy with who you are i wish i had examples of what i'm what keeps kind of revolving in my head so i'm just gonna talk about this for a second because your concept for a nonfiction book i think is what we would call high concept where you're taking two characters and um, extrapolating the data from two years of your life, implanting that into the characters, and then telling a creative nonfiction story where they meet, and then they develop, and then they grow, and then um, eventually the character arc there would uh, resolve with uh, personal growth and perseverance, right? So mm -hmm. um, I love that concept. I think it's great for what you're doing, and I think your audience for it is broader than what you're thinking it is. Mm -hmm. Because while you're focusing on college students who might travel abroad. What you're really trying to teach people is a way of life. So you keep like, that's why I started out asking you like, okay, who is this book for? Uh, because in reality, if you're trying to teach a way of life, it's not just college students who you'd be going mm -hmm. for. In my opinion, it would be anybody that's looking for a path and you're offering an option essentially. Mm -hmm. Here's the super Genki life. Here's why you want, why this, may be the right path for you mm -hmm. and honestly if you incorporated the philosophical side of this argument with the creative nonfiction in a single book you not only be telling people here's the this the super genki way of life but here's the application of it to a real world example yeah um, the that, creative nonfiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I get that. um I get that. so i know i know you're saying it's two different books but i will tell you um the self-help section at bookstores is littered and it's it's a it's, it's almost as if somebody um somebody just blew up every single self-help section because self-help is unfortunately where your um where your outlook on life mm -hmm. may end up on a bookshelf and i don't think that's what you want dan what i'm curious about is because I have 10 stories that defined who, who I am. I have 10 stories that were all in Japan over two years uh -huh. that really defined what I, I see as Super Genki life. And those stories are separated. I'm not gonna, I, didn't, I originally wasn't gonna mention those stories in, um, in Dreamers in Japan, which is the nonfiction book. And um, so you're, sh should, I just, should I just get should I just write, focus on writing one book and not even have the other book and then I'll worry about it afterwards kind of thing? Oh, well, let me ask you this. Yeah. Um, what, what prep work did you do before starting the writing? Um, I, I wrote a lot on Wattpad, um, but more for, the philosoph more for like the philosophical side. And um, I wrote a lot on Wattpad, which is an online writing platform. And... Um, I, right. I've just, I've made the experiences. Basically, that's all I've done is made the experiences. Got you. Um, I think what would benefit you. And I have is, the picture. I, I, I have all the pictures to back up all the experiences too. Like I have videos and pictures from all, all of these things. Like uh, my idea is to literally, because um, just to quickly say this, um, one of my biggest accomplishments in high school was cheating turnitin.com. Like completely, like I, 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 <laughs> I, I cheated it and um, uh -huh. let, let me just to build the story um, we had a final project in our writing and rhetoric two class and um, uh -huh. it was choose one of the prompts we had for the whole year so I chose I chose short, short story and I had to write a 10,000 word essay right 
So what yeah. I did was I read a manga and then I just wrote what I saw happening in the pictures. So I just mimicked an already successful story. <laughs> but because uh -huh. it wasn't in a text document, turnitin.com didn't pick it up. And <laughs> I got a 93 on my first draft. Oh and, my um, God. And that was one of my biggest accomplishments in high school. That's one of the only memories I have. Oh, well, you, you beat the system. So I, I, that's fine. That, that's what the world is kind of designed around at this point. And in terms of um, in terms of where I am right now, I have all the experiences. Like I know exactly how the book is going to be written. Like I just have to do the work in my head, because I and I have all the pictures. So like when I go to describe things in Japan, I'm just going to look at the pictures and I'm going to describe what I see in the pictures. So that's gotcha. like how I'm going to use all of this to make it happen. But um, I. My characters aren't in Japan yet, though. They're, I'm still in America. So, and, and it took oh, me two gotcha. weeks to write them, even to the build-up, to the plane flight. Because the plane flight is, is one of the biggest, like, symbolic things for, for these characters. And just, they have different experiences. And um, I, I don't know, Dan. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, the, the part you're at right now, in, there's a, are you familiar with the hero's journey? I've heard of it before. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly underread. That's the thing about me. I'm terribly <laughs> underread. You know, and I, I didn't watch many films growing up, so um, I, I often you say underread, I say uncultured. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so I, I'm in the same boat. Um, one thing I did learn is, um, is a lot of like story elements and story structure things. Mm -hmm. Um, so your characters are at the hero's journey step, um, which is the, um, the leaving the ordinary world and stepping into the new world. Mm -hmm. So in that case, um, yes, you're right. Very important moment where they're going to discover a whole new world. It's going to be like dis uh, like describing stepping out of the wardrobe and a line of witch in the wardrobe and describing the new world that they're going to step into. So mm -hmm. like, yes, you're absolutely right. That's an amazing moment. Um, one thing I would I would challenge you to do though mm -hmm. um, is it sounds like you know exactly what you want this book to Maybe be, so. and it sounds like you've already written a lot of that uh, out, like what you want. Mm -hmm. um, I almost wonder if you were to look at the philosophical side, like mm -hmm. the way of life side, and were able to incorporate that either thematically or as like entries in it, like mm -hmm. the captain's journal, um, within the actual nonfiction, the creative nonfiction like between chapters or at certain points in the book. Yeah. If you would not only be able to accomplish what you want as the um, philosophical side of, of the argument for um, the super Genki life, but also um, be able to share the story, the applied version of that philosophy in the same writing. Cause like in nonfiction, you can do whatever you want and it's amazing. You can't do that a lot of times in like a novel, you know, or in fiction. Or in screenwriting, because there's like format and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. It, I love the the fact that you built this um, this philosophy of life around super genki life, and um, I just want I want it to be in your nonfiction book. I just I want it to be. I I, I want there to be yeah. elements of it, and it sounds like you're already going to be doing that. I think, you know? and from what I'm thinking about you, because Monica, she, she, Monica's the most recent year that I've lived in Japan, so she, I feel a lot more strongly towards her. And uh, um, don't tell Rita I said that, but um, <laughs> uh, he, he, he was. Give it to me. He, he was the year that I lived on study abroad, and that was a couple. That was many years ago. Uh, but don't tell him. He, he has. He, he, he's pretty like emotionally resilient because he's adopted, but he's like never asked his parents where he was from, and then they, they revealed it to him at 19. And uh, uh. he find because he has an, an American name, which is Michael Tarlingson, and then uh -huh. they tell him that he was adopted, and his name was Juta Nakamura um, first, and then the sh the shift comes from the change of name and understanding that his father has a textile business, and he was being like up brought to take over the business, but now a mango fell on his head. Uh, they have a mango. He lives in North Carolina. They have an uh -huh. out of season mango tree that's never yelled, yielded any fruit. And then the day that they um, decide to tell him he's under the mango tree, like always, just sitting, playing like a, playing Guns Girls, which is like a phone video game where you have to like kill zombies and stuff. And uh -huh. um, the moment his parents tell him this, uh, an out of season mango falls on his head and like leaves him with a scar. And he's like bleeding and stuff. And he's like, I think I should go to Japan now. It's just one of those like <laughs> come to reality quick kind of weird things. And um, 
I think for Monica, because Yuta is not writing. Yuta is trying to figure out who he is, and then Monica is uh-huh. trying to write her blog and figure out what she wants to do with her life at the same time. And um, I think I can I could have a blog writing chapters in the book that could show the application of the philosophy as well too. Yeah. Which would yeah um yeah. Uh, my my only concern though is that when you look at books of like philosophy and things, mm-hmm. um, usually they just sit on bookshelves. It's very hard to publish a book and not make it like self help, like mm-hmm. make it actually like you know here's a new way of life, and like get it out there the same way you would get like a creative uh, nonfiction. Mm-hmm. So that's just my oh, always going to be my concern when talking to folks about um, like philosophy books. Like I, there was a guy I talked to that um, he published a book, uh, nonfiction, and it was his like how to get started kind of book, mm-hmm. um, and it was just really hard to market it. Mm-hmm. Um, where you have this really cool philosophy thing, like the Super Genki Life thing, which by the way is sounds really cool, and what you're doing with your character sounds really great too. Um, so, I think that if you did incorporate some um, the Super Genki Life philosophy into the book, mm-hmm. either and I'm thinking like thematically, right, where it's it's un- it's all undertone, which is okay, what you're already okay, doing. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah. If you're not gonna do it as like in chapters in the book, then you could do it under as an undercurrent. Yeah. Um, and then that would set you up for being able to release that book afterwards. So like, yeah. Um, high concept is is the word that I would use to describe your your book yeah I, I am excited to see what you do with it definitely and um dan i have to go to work in about three to four minutes so okay we're, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna stop it here today but thank you so much for the um for for the conversation it was very enlightening and very thought-provoking i'm, I'm happy that we had it uh, everyone on my stream please go follow dan the noodle man we don't know the origins of his name yet but um, I'm sure I'm sure it's just as exciting as my origins. So uh, I'm gonna link you up his his Twitch channel over in chat. Yeah. Please go give him a follow. Dan, thank you so much for the chat today. Um, let's let's have let's have it again soon. Let's uh, let's keep talking about this. I, I I love how you said involving yourself in creative communities is um is something to do. And um, I mean. Yeah, if, if, if you're willing, I'll rely on you whenever I need some opinion on on something. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to do the same with you, too. Um, it has been fantastic talking to you. Um, I had, Again, I do hope that we do this in the future as well. Mm-hmm. And yeah, just keep me up to date on the book. Um, hopefully I can drop into a stream <laughs> at some point soon and uh, and get to hang out. I'm also going to post your Twitch in uh, in chat and then... We'll do the social media thing too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Um, do you have any links? Post your link in your chat, and then I'll repost it in mine, man. So it's like, I, I usually don't sure. do. I don't usually don't do this, but it's, it's so exciting. Oh, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm telling people at my job about this book too. Like I tell you, I go to my job and I tell my manager about my book and stuff. It's really weird, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'm just happy to be able to share this kind of vision. And I think it's like um, the brainstorming, the bubbling of the brainstorming and figuring it out and oh, dude i'm so excited for the next time we do this yeah definitely um and you know if we want to make this a thing we can like mm-hmm. a podcast thing that would be fun um, yeah or yeah just just chilling like the cool thing about starting out on twitch is like nobody starting out has an identity until they form one mm-hmm. so like if podcasts become your thing that'd be awesome i'd love to be a part of it yeah it's definitely one of those one-offs i try to have like six or seven categories i hit every week um food and food we have the gym we have fitness food we have podcasts i have what's it called uh just writing art travel outdoors Mm -hmm. and then yeah i try to hit a couple of different categories to give some variety because again it's building the lifestyle right like yesterday i had this yesterday i had this um this this cheat day stream right and um, I was like, you know, I'm what? imagining you with just like a pizza in front of you and like a box of Twinkies. <laughs> it, it was a giant, like amazing American Kobe beef burger. And I had sweet potato <laughs> fries, a chocolate milkshake, sugar cookies, chocolate chip cookies. It was like, oh, my that I couldn't explain to you. Like every bite was like ecstasy. It was so good. <laughs> 
Okay. The if reason it was ever, yeah. The reason ever need, it, I need to call something food porn. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> the reason it was so good though is because I was like, look, I worked out at the gym for a month, four days every week. I finished my first micro set. This is my first cheat day in like years. My first nice. official cheat day in years. And that was oh, like wow. the, that was the lifestyle aspect that I put into the stream because it it is all revolving around this idea. And I'm not. Persistence is my hardest one, and I'm gonna take that quote and I'm gonna run with it. And I'm gonna get back to you next time we do this. Um, Sounds good. I'm really gonna think about that quote. But anyway, Dan, it's been absolutely wonderful to talk to you today, man. Everyone, Dan the Noodle Man, go check him out. I'll see you later, buddy. Yeah, you too. And everyone in in the stream here, uh, in in my stream, Super Genki Life. I have linked his Twitch channel in uh, in chat, and then uh, we'll share him on socials as well. So take care, Super. Have a good day at work. You too. See you. Later.